Our scriptural text for today comes from Isaiah, the second chapter, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, if you wish to join me. I pray that you shall find it in uh, the Old Testament, uh, shortly after the Psalms. Uh, you will find Isaiah chapter 2, one of the major prophets of our faith. In fact, uh, Isaiah is the prophet that is quoted the most in the New Testament. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And it reads this way. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judea and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountains of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in God's paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. God will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will take up sword against nation, nor will they take, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I ask that you hide this humble servant behind the cross, that they may only see your guiding light, your strength, your love, your compassion. And soften my voice, that they may only hear your redeeming words that comfort, heal, and encourage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, for those of you who uh, may not know, we have been on a sermon series on some of the great hymns of the church. And therefore, today's subject is on the one hymn that you just sang, O God of Every Nation, <coughs> key word being every nation, with a subtitle, Who is Our Enemy? Who is Our Enemy? Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say to all of you that I love America. Amen? I absolutely love America with all its beauty and imperfections. I know why people rush here in the thousands in order to experience this land of milk and honey in a biblical sense of the word. Also, they've come to experience the land of opportunity and freedom and more patriotic way of putting it. But when we, when we draw back the curtain on America, and actually meet the Wizard of Oz. All that we promote as glitter ain't always gold. Uh, 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 Dr. DeBell, all that ain't glitter isn't always gold. <laughs> and I had to put that in there. Yes, America does offer opportunities. But how do we care for the least of these? Are we good at caring for the poor, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, those who have been silenced by different situations? Yes, we've made freedom a constitutional right, but is freedom always free? Now, I cannot speak for other branches of the armed forces, but I can speak for myself as a Marine, and I can tell you this. There's nothing you can say about America that I cannot defend it. Because I can tell you right now, I have pride in myself and in this country, and it came through my experience in the Marine Corps. Hoorah! <laughs> you couldn't shake my loyalty to this country and my love for this country if you tried. But as a follower of Christ, I am also loyal to, to turning this glitter we promote into gold, which is why it is for the sake of the gospel that I am most committed. And so to all my servicemen and women, thank you. 
Thank you for your service to our beloved country. Thank you for your sacrifice and perseverance and loyalty to the red, white, and blue. You are indeed some of America's finest and most precious gifts to this country. I applaud you. Each serviceman and woman took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, domestic, and to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Each of us was given a code of conduct to live by, and for the United States Marines, our slogan is and shall always be Latin, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. And who would have thunk it that one day, I would emerge from USMC and become UMC. <laughs> Some days I still scratch my head. And so, how does our loyalty to this country as military active and retired men and women, and as citizens of the United States, play out as Christians devoted to another responsibility, which is to obey the greatest commandment, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Well, I'd like to offer us a few things that we can think about, and I'll let your conscience and your heart decide. As I, re as I was researching our scripture for today, I realized that the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Micah had received the same directive from God when it came to war. The directive was the same word for word both in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, and Micah chapter 4, verse 3, says these words. God will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Isaiah and Micah lived during the same era which Isaiah preceded Micah by only a few decades. They both prophesied to, during the reign of Jotham and Ahaz and Hezekiah. But there is no indication throughout the Bible that these two men ever met one another, nor did they share notes. Yet they received the same message from God. In the military, we call that a confirmation, a confirmation when two different sources share the same information. Likewise, in the military, we're taught that whenever you're given a directive, you've got to verify the information. Am I right? You've got to verify the information. For example, if the radio man was given instructions that there was going to be a fire attack on this particular location, he might say, do you read me? Do you read me? And then after everything had been translated over and over again, he would say, roger that, over and out. Amen? So now we've received a directive. We've received a confirmation on how we ought to deal with situations as it relates to war. So I want to give us a few thoughts to ponder. How do we as Christians respond to creating weapons, handguns designed for mass death, when we've been directed to beat our swords in the plowshares? How do we as Christians respond to the creation of surface-to-air missiles when we've been directed to beat our spears into pruning hooks? How do we as Christians continue to fight war after war when our directive is to train for war no more? Well, before I answer that question, I will offer us something to think about. I need for you to understand a few things about Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet, which meant that he was speaking about the future. Isaiah was also speaking to people who mostly had the same culture and thus shared the same values. But the reason I believe that Judea and Jerusalem were at war, which is why most wars are going on, is that the enemies didn't realize or refused to believe they were all serving the same God. Let me say that again. The reason I believe that Judea and Jerusalem were at war 
is the same reason why most wars are created. The enemies didn't realize or refuse to believe they were all serving the same God. If you call God Yahweh or Elohim, Adonai or Jehovah, Allah, who or Buddha, creator or the almighty, at the end of the day, it's the same God who created the heavens and the earth and all that dwell therein. The question is, the question we should be asking ourselves is this. Before we go to war, is who is our enemy? So here's my suggestion. Uh, some of you who, who, who have, who've hung out with me lately know that I have an all-time favorite movie. It's called The War Room. Anybody seen it? The War Room. Uh, the, the, the premise of the movie is about uh, uh, a couple who's struggling in their marriage. And Clara, uh, the one who's consulting the wife, keeps saying to, 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 to the wife, um, uh, aren't you tired of fighting losing battles with your husband? <laughs> and she says, yes, I am. She says, well, you need to identify who the real enemy is in your life. And in the paraphrase, I wrote this. Until you identify who the real enemy is in your life, you'll always be fighting a losing battle. Let me say that again. Until you identify who the real enemy is in your life, you will always be fighting a losing battle. Church, as long as there is evil in the world, which isn't going anywhere in our lifetime, we will always need a military. Because, but as Christians, particularly as citizens, one of the best ways to support our servicemen and women is to pray for their protection and our collective serenity. Watch this. The best way to support our servicemen and women is to pray for their protection and our collective serenity. So let us take a real good look into the mirror about ourselves by using the serenity prayer. Part one, Lord grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. We cannot change the way that ISIS, Al Qaeda, or any of the other communist countries feel about us. We can't change the way they're gonna feel about us. But I believe and the reason is, I believe, is because our cultures are dividing us. Our cultures are dividing us. And also because we fail to realize and we refuse to believe that we're serving the same God. Democracy is not for everybody. And of course, communist, communism doesn't work for us. Dictatorship does not work for us. But at the end of the day, if needs are being met, freedom is being shared, and love is being cherished, who are we or anyone else to dictate to someone else how they ought to be living? Who made us God's watchdog? I love my country. I started with that, right? I love America. I love everything about it. Its beauty and its imperfections. The second part of the serenity prayer. Lord, give us the courage to change the things that we can. Back to the glitter I alluded to. We are the richest country on the planet. By capita, we have the most millionaires in the world and the top 1% living in this country who literally make world decisions. Yet erasing homelessness is not on the national agenda. Lord, give me the courage to change the things that I can. And guess what? There's a state called Utah. You ever heard of Utah? Believe it or not, They've almost eradicated homelessness in their state. Google it. 
Utah has almost eradicated homelessness in their state. They have a unique philosophy. And we have something similar in, in other states. The homeless are given a home, except in some states, or in most states, if you have a habit and you're tested as having used that habit, you can no longer enter into that home. Well, the challenge is, well, what Utah has figured out, well, if they have this habit, instead of kicking them out back on the street, maybe we should give them help while they're still living in the home. Pretty novel idea. We're trying to get them off the street, right? Help them while they're in the home, and then once they now have a home, they can now help someone else. You see how it works? But for some reason, in America, homelessness is not on the national agenda. And yet we have our own state, a state here in America, that has shown how it works. Hmm. Y'all quiet now. That's okay. We are one of the most diverse countries in the world. But erasing racism is not a national objective. the most diverse country in the world. But erasing racism is not on the national agenda. The problem we face in this country that we can actually solve is when faithful leaders stop turning the other cheek and realize that the parable that Jesus spoke about was an act of civil disobedience. Um, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to mess y'all up now. Watch this. Watch this. How many times did you have, have you read the scripture when, some, when, 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 when Jesus told him, if someone smacks you, what? Turn the other cheek. Just let him smack you again, right? No. That's not what that scripture means at all. I'm going to break it down for you. Watch this. Back in the day, if someone were to disrespect you, they slap you with their left hand. The left hand is the hand in which you wash your bottom, right? That's the unclean hand. If they wanted to respect you, they shake your, shake your hand with their right hand. You with me? So now, if the person smacks you, they're going to smack you with their left hand. If you turn the other cheek, they wouldn't dare slap you with the right hand because then they would be showing you respect. And if you used your backhand, you might break your knuckles. So in actuality, that was a form of civil disobedience. It wasn't about letting someone smack you again. So now you tell everyone else who's been misconstrued, that's not what, be, what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about civil disobedience. When you know something's wrong, do something about it. What did I talk about last week? What's, what's our biggest sin? Apathy. Ooh, some, ooh, somebody used a big word. Apathy, yeah, apathy. That's our biggest sin. When we know something's wrong, but we do nothing about it. As military service men and women, and as citizens who support them, we are truly, are we truly living up to our oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to bear true faith and allegiance to the same? Are we living up to our oath when eradicating racism, greed, poverty, and human dignity is not on the national agenda. As Christians, do we hear Psalm 27 when it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Serve the Lord. Be of good courage. God shall strengthen thy heart. 
the prophets Isaiah and Micah heard the same message from God. What are you hearing right now? Part three, closing out. Lord, give us the wisdom to know the difference. Now, unless you are a Native American, we are all descendants from another country. Walk with me. Now, unless you're a Native American, we're all descendants of another country. When you do your research, you'll learn that all people migrated from Africa. You still with me? And if you believe in the Bible, it all began with Adam and Eve, who were formed from the dust of the earth by one God. Just one. Doesn't matter what name you give them. Just one God. Isaiah and Micah heard God say, study war no more. And so I asked us two questions. What war was God talking about? What war was God talking about? Because at the end of the day, who is our enemy? And the church said, amen. Amen. amen.